message is vision adjustment. It's something that's, uh, that's really come to my attention lately, that the verse that's been standing out for several weeks, but I didn't really do anything with it. I just made a note of it in my prayer journal. But it's Proverbs 29, 18. And it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And a better translation even says, where there is no redemptive revelation, the people perish. Revelation means you need to see with the eyes of God. It's not goals. It's not just good ideas. It's not vain imaginations. A redemptive revelation is seeing with the eyes of Jesus what he wants done and the plans and the purposes. Uh, my peers, even when I was a very young pastor, my peers used to tease me. They'd always say, um, anytime they, uh, a bunch of pastors got together, they'd say, well, Dennis will have enough vision for all of us. If, we, if, if there's a void, he'll fill it. As a matter of fact, one time, uh, my spiritual father was developing a network of churches. And when he did it, uh, my vision was always the dome and the pillars and the da-da-da. And they were teasing me because when he drew a circle on the board, they go, oh, there's Dennis again. Now, before you start drawing circles, they said, that'll be Dennis's top view of the dome. And, <laughs> and so I would sneak it in for everything. But I'm convinced that, that God has a plan, and it was before the foundation of the earth, before Adam sinned that he has for each and every one of us. But I find out that vision adjustment is probably the most necessary thing for the individual believer. I really am sad to say I've run into so many people that have had visions and dreams and nothing works. Do you know anybody like that? Perhaps you've done it. You've had a vision and a dream. And I say that the problem, there's problems in there. And if we can cover some of those problems today, we can eradicate uh, a lot of unnecessary wandering in the wilderness. And so the first thing I wanted to say is that Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no redemptive revelation, the people run wild. And the person who isolates himself seeks his own desire and he rages, he wars against wise judgment. Have you ever had someone that wanted to do what they wanted to do so they made sure they didn't take counsel with anybody? Have you ever seen that pattern? That's a common pattern. It's like if somebody says, I know what God said, I know what God said to do, but they don't want to bounce it off of anybody else, you can be rest assured there's probably a part of them that's not so sure. But they want what they want, and they can't let it go. It becomes an agenda, it becomes an idol. And Ezekiel 14.4 is good warning for all the prophetic people. Ezekiel 14.4 says, they that come to the Lord, they come to the prophet, with an idol in their heart, I, the Lord, will answer them according to the idol. Meaning God doesn't deceive, but what it means is that you're going to hear what you want to hear. I'll give you an answer, but you're going to hear it and interpret it in what you want. And I've watched that over the years again and again and again. And I believe we're in a place now where we're offering four levels of vision for individuals. I mean, generic vision that is Christ-centered. And if, if you're one of those people that have been wandering or, or disappointed, um, disillusioned because you haven't seen some of the things that you felt clearly God spoke to you has not come to pass, then I'd say pay close attention to this message because we're going we're gonna to cut through all of the areas where you can fall short and misinterpret. And right now, uh, it's, to me, there's, there's uh, a, a preparation for a great move of God in the church, but at the same time, there's rising up all kinds of false teachings and heretical teachings at the same time, which makes sense that religion would rise up to wage war against the people that are hungering and thirsting for the reality of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Everything that we teach, everything, has to do with how to make Jesus Lord, not how to be a nice person, how to make Jesus Lord. And I want to cover what revelation is. First of all, if a person has a vision, and these are friends of yours, and you can help them as well as help yourself, the first thing to notice that all of the revelation, and I've got a track record, that everything God told me to do, it, it, it developed. And I start from scratch. I don't start with a core group. I don't start with a business plan. I don't start with uh, all kinds of external resources. I basically, what God has done, he sends me somewhere and basically puts an advertisement in the paper, and there I am by myself. And 
it worked. It worked from the time I was in my 20s to now I'm in my mid-60s. So from 20s to 60s, it's worked. I've got a track record. I've seen what works and what doesn't work. Made lots of mistakes, but learned from them. And so I found out that the keys were in the vision. It has to be a redemptive vision. It can't be a pizza dream. It can't be a fantasy. And I really want to cover that, fantasy. I have watched more Christians attach fantasy to their visions and dreams. In other words, they painted a scenario of how it was going to work out, what it was going to look like. And quite frankly, I wonder, how come, how come you have more information than I ever got and you're not doing it? So I think we've got to pull down vain imaginations, interpretations that were not God, that they were imposed by you, and it tripped you up. And I don't want anybody tripped up. I want to see us going for everything that God planned for you. All right? So the one, uh, one of the simple areas of revelation is that when God gives a revelation, he's basically giving you a revelation to become in other words, life transformation, being, and he also gives you a vision for the kingdom. And the deception seems to be, I talk to person after person after person, and they share their vision with me, and it's all about them. It's all about getting from God. And I'm saying therein lies probably the biggest, the biggest mishap with your vision is because you become the center of the vision instead of God. We need to use a very simple principle of the Apostle Paul. He first saw that vision, when it's a redemptive revelation, not a goal. Goals and redemptive revelations are not the same. Goals can be good to get you to the plans and the purposes of God because he'll, he'll orchestrate it. But a redemptive revelation has two main prongs. One the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, that he called me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me. Your primary vision needs to be Christ-likeness, not what you think you could do. Your primary revelation is that Christ be formed in you, that Christ-likeness, it's an internal vision of being changed into the image of God. Once you move from that center you can get off course doing something wonderful. Do you believe that? That you could get off course doing something wonderful. I watched peers struggle because I saw that they were moving from the centrality and the simplicity of Christ to evangelism orientation, doctrine orientation, message orientation. I mean, I, I've had peers that basically said, I'm sick and tired of getting another message for Sunday. That's, that's coming from a preacher's point of view. I don't know if you'd identify with that. But and I'm sitting there thinking, something's wrong with that. Is it wrong to give a message? Is it wrong to be evangelistic? Is it wrong to be uh, doctrine-oriented? Is it wrong to be mission-oriented? No, none of those things. But the primary move is a, is a very very gradual move from center. Once you move from the center, your vision is marred and it gets interpreted and it gets, it gets tangled up in the mire. So if God's given you a revelation, the primary revelation is Christ in you. The second aspect of revelation is that it's not only, Paul said, uh, I've, I've just made myself a little love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his heart. If that is your prerequisite, your vision will remain pure. That I'm just going to be a little love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the deception in most people's vision is what God's got for me. Always. It always goes back to man-centered. And once it's man-centered, you're going to taint it with your own interpretation. And I've watched this happen so many times, and I don't want to see people falling through the cracks uh, simply because they decided to interpret what God said. If you get a re revelation from God, then know this. All revelation, all revelation is first about you changing. Because he'll give you a revelation, but you're at point A, B, C. You're not going to be the same person at X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z, you should have been changed and transformed, matured, and grown up in the things of God so that you could even handle what he had for you. 
So anyone that comes to me and has a vision with all this great detail, I dismiss it. Because I'm saying, if God ever gave that much detail, heck, we, we'd, be, we'd be really inspired to just go and do it ourselves, wouldn't we? And bring it to pass tomorrow. I want it tomorrow. But he doesn't work that way. So uh, if there's one point that we can really say is that take your revelation and go back to how is that revelation that God's given me for a vision, what must I do internally to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God? Secondly, what does it do for the kingdom? Do you know, even the revelation that could sound selfish, like basically, you know, Bishop Hammond said he saw five prophetic marriages, what he would call prophetic marriages in his lifetime. So he had a strict criteria. Everybody likes to believe their marriage is prophetic. <laughs> uh, some pathetic, but prophetic. Uh, and... Ours was one of them that basically w was done. But my landlady had a prophetic word for me. The minute she found out that I had met Jennifer and we were getting married, she said, look, and this is good advice to everybody. God is not giving her for you. See, that goes back into the vision, oh, God wants her for me. Oh, how wonderful I, I, I am. You know, how blessed, blessed I am in getting, getting, getting. No, 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 no. He says, I'm giving her to you and you to her so that together you do kingdom purposes. Genuine vision from God will have internal change first. Secondly, external kingdom priority. Not about you. Not about you. Say that with me. It's not about me. Everybody that distorts revel revelation, everyone that distorts vision and messes up their life has it somehow, after applying the patterns and the principles, they somehow stop and go back to what's in it for me. And from that point on, you see a failure to thrive because they become the center of their vision rather than Christ-centered vision. So what is Revelation primarily about? Internal change and doing the kingdom business, not getting. And you know what's funny? It's, it's, it's like God's given me houses and cars, but I never one time got a revelation or a vision that God was giving me a house or a car. And he's given me houses and cars supernaturally. But I was about his business. And he says, because you are concerned with housing me, I will house you. Another thing he told me is because I silently supported my spiritual father without him knowing who I was for years. He said, because you were faithful in another man's ministry, I'm giving you one of your own. Those things are internal. You can't fake it because God is the one that is going to be the center. And the danger is that there, it, people are not connecting with people. They're not connecting with God's vision. They're connecting with their own whims, dreams, wishes, <laughs> instead of visions and fantasy. And those fantasies become an idol. Do you realize that? A fantasy becomes an idol because you, you are clinging to some goal that you made, fabricated. It wasn't God. The initial purpose might have been God, but the focus is still too much all about you. So some of the prophetic words you've gotten, some of the prophetic dreams you've gotten, you've got to realize you can't interpret or fantasize them because they will become idols or agendas. Fantasy attracts seducing spirits. Did you know that? It'll get you going in circles the rest of your life. An agenda or an idol will attract a seducing spirit, and you will feel driven to do that thing. And you won't listen to counsel. You won't bounce it off of anybody because you're already driven. I've watched it with marriages again and again. 38 years of ministry, I've seen it over and over. It's that all of a sudden somebody wants to get married. They want what they want. They've got to have a man. They've got to have a woman. And they will all of a sudden go from solid Christianity to they will isolate themselves. They don't want another opinion. They don't want to bounce it off a of spiritual authority for fear that they might possibly, possibly disagree. He who isolates himself seeks their own desire, not wise counsel. That's Proverbs 18.1. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and he actually rages against all wise judgment. So God is basically saying, uh, here it is in the Amplified. It says, he who willfully separates and estranges himself from God and man 
seeks his own desire and pretext to break out against all wise and sound judgment. So any way you look at it, isolation is a key indication that nobody understands. That's a good one, huh? But revelation is primarily about internal change. Paul says that I was taken from my mother's womb to have Christ formed in me. You know, every one of you could take that same vision. And if you don't have that vision, you're probably off on a tangent of your own making. I'm telling you, fantasy in the prophetic camp is as dangerous as pornography is in the world. Do you know that right now, it's a little side note, you think this is a rabbit trail, but it ties in. Fantasy in the prophetic is the same as the, as the epidemic proportion of pornography. Do you know that pornography is rewriting uh, people's brains and that it's erasing relationship? It's a dopamine thrill. And it's a relation, and you have now, now these are unsaved people, this is not something I'm condoning, but from the ages of 16 to 20, those that are sexually active and single, no longer are finding pleasure in their partner. Because both are engaged. A huge percentage of females as well as males are so engaged in pornography that what it's doing is there is no longer any interest in their partner. And these are unsaved people that are basically committing fornication. But at the same time, they're learning it isn't working. They are finding a greater thrill from the pornography than from reality. And I'm saying the church may not be caught up in pornography, but I'll tell you what, they are caught up in fantasy and the prophetic camp is probably even more guilty because they're more, they've been trained in the visual and I see, I see, I see, and I hear, I hear what the Spirit of the Lord says. But here's the problem that I have with it is that basically I'm seeing too much wishes and visions that are centered in them, not God. Genuine vision, without a redemptive revelation, the people perish. They cast off restraint. They don't want any rules or regulations. And another translation says they perish. In other words, it's not going to work. You are not to fabricate the scenario to your prophetic words. Because when God did something, he did it. Now, let me, let me, let me get into the seduction a little bit more. When you interpret or fantasize a legitimate revelation on how it's going to work out, you open up to a seducing spirit and religious spirits that can drive you to see that you get it done, that you fulfill it. When you have a seducing spirit or an agenda, you can no longer see the truth. Ezekiel 14.4, if anyone comes to the prophet with an idol in their heart, I, the Lord, will answer according to the idol. They won't hear my answer, they'll interpret it. We were, when we were down in, at Santa Rosa, we remember this one man came and, and God says, I'm giving you a new marriage, which means I'm gonna work on you and I'm gonna work on her and they're ready to go together. And of course, he just got a new marriage. He divorced her against at least 15 prophetic voices, senior prophetic voices says, you can't interpret it like that. And goes, but see, once you say you can't interpret like that, you won't listen to anybody else now. You're going to do what you want to do, and you're going to do it your way. I mean, that's extreme, but I'm telling you, we do it in the more subtle ways. I'm more afraid of the subtle ways than the, than the exaggerated mistakes, all right? Yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> Jennifer put an illustration in my notes. I, I, get, I give my notes to Jennifer to type because I don't type. And she puts these little, these little, I'm reading along my notes, I'm going, Where, where'd that come from? <laughs> so, but interpretation causes people to shipwreck. Here's a prophetic word given to Jen. Oh, I don't know where this came from. <laughs> the person delivering the prophecy saw her future husband in a cowboy boot and cowboy hat. Well, no cowboy hat and boots for this Chicago boy. That is definitely not me, but it was a true word, though not in the natural, but in the spiritual. What, what if Jen had gone around looking for someone who dressed like that? And trust me, Christians do that. 
what if she had not been open to me based on a wrong interpretation of that prophetic word? I can't marry you. No boots, no hat. Get out of here. I'm, I know God said, but I have my own way of this happening. I see that everywhere, and particularly in the prophetic camp. So come on, get back to it. If you really want to see the vision that God has for your life, it's got to be internal change in you, a redemptive revelation, not just a revelation. Some of you had too much pizza the night before and you get a revelation. The true spiritual interpretation? Cowboys round up wandering, wandering cattle, and that is our gifting and that is our anointing. I want the people that have been burnt, that have been hurt and wounded in church, and I want to turn them into an army, and I want to see that they become productive and they retap into the vision that God has for them. They get them through the gates to the corral. They don't control them, but they corral them and give them some healthy guidelines and some, some place that they can return and bounce stuff off of when they get a little silly. And we, do, and, and we direct believers. I don't care. So far, we've developed even a troubleshooting manual that some of my pastor friends covet, and I won't give it to them because it's earned. It's not purchased. And you have to be a people helper first. And after you pray through a lot of people, we found out that I had a guy that was a hunter, and he says, he says, yeah, he says, you're, he says, they go off on this tangent, they go off on that tangent, and he said, you always get right back to Christ in them. And I don't care, and that's really what we've mastered over, over these years, is that people have all these tangents that they go off to, but ultimately, you know, and even sometimes they say silly stuff that you know the answer to. I don't even tell them the answer. I'm not even going to go there. I'm not going to get into an argument. They'll say, well, my, my pastor said I shouldn't, la, da, 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 da. So I don't know about that, but unless we deal with that emotional pain, you're not going to get any better. I don't know about that, but unless we deal with that emotional pain. I don't care. I'm always hurting them into Christ. Because if we don't point them to Christ, there really is no solution. Some people use arguments to basically distance themselves from internal change. Let's just talk about it. That way I don't have to go there. I don't have to live it. And, and so basically we direct believers to the, place, to the place of Christ within. Full stature is basically a branding that we have on our DNA. It's not just a title for the ministry. It is the, it is the redemptive purpose. God called me not to be so much evangelistic as he did call me to grow up the church of Jesus Christ, to challenge the pew sitters to become uh, uh, people that are partakers instead of just um, participators rather than just pew sitters. But ultimately, ultimately, to point them to Christ within, that Christ might be formed in them, that they would grow up. So everything I'm saying today is vision adjustment. There needs to be consistent, continual adjustment in your vision of what God's called because I promise you, you don't know as much as you think you know. If God gave you a legitimate redemptive vision, he does not give you all the information that I hear everybody has. You're, 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 you're in wishings. And you're interpreting. You're filling in blanks that you shouldn't be filling in. Because if you were really a little love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, you would be basically just being conformed to his image, saying, I'm just doing what God's telling me to do at this moment, and I'm going to pursue the transformation that God's doing at this particular time in my life. I'm going to be changed in the image of God. And Paul says, not only was I taken from my mother's womb that Christ would be formed in me, transformation, growing in the grace and the knowledge of God, but he says, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. In other words, he knew the internal being, but he also knew there was a redemption and that God called me to be a witness of all of these things that he showed me. And, I, and that is, he lived his life with those two primaries. The specifics came out and emerged as God unfolded it. And I hear too many people have it all unfolded. And that scares me because you're going to shipwreck. That's fantasy. And fantasy, like pornography, is a make-believe relationship, and it will cause you to be driven. Isn't that sad that they no longer find married people, single people, having relations? They no longer find satisfaction in their partner because the pornography is more satisfying. They are remapping their brains with dopamine and the thrill to where, and they are erasing the bonding that God does through oxytocin. Isn't that something? God's got a chemical in the body that when you hold a little baby in your arm, there's a chemical being released that allows you to bond. 
And when you're getting into these fantasies, even, even prophetic, everything, they're saying, how in the world is he tying prophetic vision in with pornography? Because both of them have a, an element of fantasy that will cause you to shipwreck relationally. Your primary relationship is Christ in you. Your secondary is doing kingdom business. And that's our passion, to change, grow up the body of Christ, and to do what he called us to do. However, fantasizing causes you to prematurely not take the interim baby steps that are necessary to fulfill the vision. And whether you like it or not, for those of you who think you've got your vision all cut out for you, God will not let you see what it ultimately looks like. If he did, you'd mess it up somehow because you're not ready for it now. <laughs> the person at A, B, and C is not the same person at X, Y, and Z. And you've got to understand that there was a steps in between a maturity and transformation that are required. If he, God only gives pieces of the puzzle. And I want to go over some of the dangers of fantasy. Because if this is going to be a vision adjustment, I want to get people back on track to they re fall in love with the simplicity of Christ and it will reorientate you. I had pastor friends that needed this because they were doctrine-oriented or message-centered. Anything other than Christ-centered is a slight step off the path and you're going to mess up. Christ-centered has to be the primary. In other words, your battle cry for every believer should be like uh, Genesis 15.1. For you are my exceedingly great reward. Once he stops becoming the great reward, you're off on a tangent. So the dangers of fantasy. Fantasy is dangerously close to the type of pornography that we talked about. It's been said that women's fantasy life is just as damaging as a man who is addicted to internet porn. The same brain pathways are triggered. Fantasy is your manipulation and control of make-believe circumstances to create a world that is an illusion over which you are God. I don't know, the battle cry needs to be, not be, I will not have that man rule over me. People that said that were in big trouble. But just like pornography, Here's the key. It disconnects you from what is really in front of you. I mean, even the secular world's learning that. That they're, they're no longer connected even in their relationships because in the brain, it erases. The brain competes for space and the dopamine erases relationship and increases the lust for thrill. Oxytocin, on the other hand, basically bond you relationally. And God's saying, not only does the world need this, but the church needs this because we were supposed to bond together in the bonds of peace. That relationship was to be a separate entity that God wanted to develop. But if you're busy in your make-believe vision, you won't connect with the people in the church because they don't understand my vision or I'm superior to their vision or I know better than their vision or if I become part of their vision, then somehow I'll be limited in my own way. And I don't want, any, I don't want anything holding me back because I'm a wild maverick. <laughs> I don't want, don't fence me in, as the song used to go. But it's basically fantasy rewires your arousal pathways in your brain. Can you see the correlation between someone with a vision of their own making? In other words, it re you start getting so aroused for a vision of your own making, even if it's fantasy, that it becomes a motivator. But in that motivation, you're also disconnecting from the people and the relationships that are in front of you that were put there by God for your safety. He places the solitary in families, not just so he could corral them, but for their safety. In the multitude of counsel, their safety. But as fantasy, neural pathways are hardwired. This is Jennifer stuff sticking in my notes again. <laughs> the fantasy of neural pathways are hardwired. Neuroplastic change takes place. Now, if you don't understand it, you talk to her. All right. You understand that the brain is flexible and that it, it, it's teachable, but it changes and those patterns change. But 
because it competes for space with the connections of relationship. Fantasy releases dopamine. Boy, you got a lot of stuff in here, Jennifer. Fantasy <laughs> releases dopamine thrill so that the activity and the sensation becomes intertwined with your brain. You want that satisfaction. You want that thrill. Dopamine is the molecule of lust. And lust gives legal ground to seducing spirits to drive you. Religious spirits will drive you. That's how you can even tell a person's got a religious spirit. They're driven. They're not led. They're not following Jesus. They're being coerced and pushed. And they feel like, I can't help it. I can't help it. That's a bad sign when you can't help it and you can't stop it. Because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. The fantasies become idols. Idols have seducing spirits attached. That's why they can't hear what God is saying. They can only hear from the lust demon. This validates Ezekiel 14.4. They that come to the prophet with an idol in their heart, they can't hear clearly. They will hear with a twist. The exciting images of the fantasy causes the brain to remap at the expense of what used to interest you. Let's stop there. That it causes the brain to remap what used to interest you now doesn't interest you because lust is taking over. Can you see, most women, married women that I've ministered to over the years, they knew when their husbands were in pornography. It was so simple. You know what they did? They felt distance. Once you feel distance, it's perceptible. They will know. They're distant. Now, it says, a fantasy that is continued, real relationships are being erased on our brains. Isn't that sad? When God's trying to restore to the church the very opposite. He's trying to bring together. So the potential requires preparation the right way or you will take it to the grave. Potential's a beautiful thing, but herein lies, go to a seminar, herein lies people with great potential. Potential means they didn't do anything with it. Potential is potential. I've watched more people tell me well, you didn't understand. I saw their potential. I saw their potential, but I also saw that they were applying no effort to change. All right? And what God's basically saying is, is that here's just some of the keys that he did with me. All right? These are just from my own life. Faithful in submitting to another man's ministry. I had Christ formed in me, and all I cared about was the kingdom message of what God was going to do for other people. Christ formed in me, other people. It wasn't about me. Whenever your vision gets distorted is when all of a sudden your vision is about you. That's still the number one telltale sign. And God basically said, you know, really, he reminded me, how can you, how can you be trusted with your own thing when you won't become part of a family mission? You can't become part of anybody else's. How can you be faithful in big things when you're not faithful in little things? And you really need someone to bounce these things off of. Submit your prophecies to a spiritual leader. Years of obedience in many small things are necessary. And your will will go through a death to your vision. And that way God can resurrect it with purity. So if you've added anything to your vision, die to it, let God resurrect it. It ain't going to go anywhere. He's not going to take it away from you, but he's going to bring it up in purity. I can remember at 30, 32 years old, they were going to give me a doctorate based on proven ministry because of what, what I had accomplished in, externally accomplished by building a church on some old campground and it prospered and everything. And they said, just based on... on uh, life accomplishment, we could have given you an honorary doctorate. And it was, it was so funny because I was saying, Jesus deserves the doctorate because I was clueless as to what I was doing. I had the faintest idea what I was doing. I just went one baby step at a time. Every time Jesus said, do something, I did it. And you come out smelling like a rose. It makes you look like you knew what you were doing all along. I didn't know what I was doing. I never pastored before. I never started a church before. I didn't have the business background. All of a sudden, God says, do it. And then baby step by baby step, he would unfold. This is the part that really grieved me, and that is that it is, it is rarely understood how much time elapses before, when God gives you a vision, whether you, whether you agree with me or not, I'm sorry, that vision is like a tiny little rosebud, 
and it's over time that it unfolds and it reveals, and every time another part of it unfolds, it requires an adjustment, a vision adjustment on your part. And we're gonna get into that later because I'm gonna give you some real practical steps that uh, you're gonna leave here a better person when, when we're done because you're gonna be able to, to check out your own vision and see where you're at in the process. But God's way of unfolding vision perspective, it's, uh, it's if you even think you know what God's doing with you, you have an inkling. At best, it's still partial. It's still a piece of the puzzle. You're at point A, B, or C now, but ultimately, fulfillment won't come until X, Y, Z, and you're going to be a different person by the time of that. So the, the process that God uses, okay, here's the part that I wanted to get to. This is the exciting part for me. All right. That I go to keep myself steady, God gave me a vision of a dome, pillars, foundations. And that was a heavenly vision. That was something that I didn't get from flesh and blood, but God said in the explanation, it's in our brochure on the church, and I'm not going to get into it, but he basically said, Dennis, if you'll take those basic principles and apply it to your life, it will keep you on track. And I did absolutely nothing but obey that for internal change. Eventually, I built a dome church that was modeled after that. Not that that was the goal. But the funny thing is, there's an adjustment after you complete every baby step that requires a faith adjustment. You need the revelation for the next step. You need the unfolding, but it's got to be faith, not you're figuring it out. And basically, you don't know what's going to happen, but you need to walk in obedience to that little bit of unfolding vision. I can remember back when I was in my 30s and I built that church, I said, oh, I guess I'm going home to be with Jesus because I'm done. <laughs> I did that vision he gave me internally and even to the point where now we have a church building that symbolizes the internal work for individuals as well as a corporate church. I guess I'm done. I really believed in my head I was going to go be with Jesus because I did everything I knew to do. And then he takes it from there and he unfolds something else. And then he unfolds something else. And it requires a radical adjustment in your vision. So don't tell me you know everything there is about your vision. He doesn't work that way. It requires steps of obedience, baby steps of obedience. And like a beautiful flower, it unfolds. And it unfolds systematically. Here's an ABC. A, B, C, D. I'm going to do it in alphabetical order so that it'll make it easy. Did, you, did they have notes? Do they have any A, B, C, D? Okay, A, B, C, D. A, adjustment. It's going to require constant patient adjustment. Yeah. The second thing is that when you patiently allow God to adjust your vision, when you begin to see from his perspective, not the one of your own making, you get balanced out. B, balance. Isn't that clever? A, adjustment. B, balance, all right? C, those that begin to see that they are part of something that is redemptive internally and for the benefit of other people, all of a sudden there becomes a oneness in the vision and there is a supernatural cohesion. We're, we're seeing that here. A supernatural cohesion to where those who have begun to live in the divine vision know that it has a cohesive power to it. And lastly, it becomes a dynamic. It becomes a dynamic that actually keeps us going when most people want to drop out, quit, burn out. There's an internal motivation that's stronger. All right? So it was like Jeremiah. There was a fire in Jeremiah's bones by the vision God had given him. And he held, it held Jeremiah even through difficult times because he had a fire in his bones. It held him. You need a vision that'll hold you when everything looks like it's falling apart or it's not working or that it's just been destroyed. The knowledge of God's purpose has to dwell in us. It has to be stronger than the situations around you. I'm watching too many people that they got this vision from God and they're falling apart because it's not coming to pass the way they wanted it to come to pass. Tells me you're in delusion, you're in fantasy, you're in illusion somehow. Somehow you have not died to your vision thoroughly because when you die to it, God will resurrect it in purity. You need it in purity, not your interpretation, not your cleverness added to it. And it has to be so strong that it will survive 
nothing. And look at, no marketing skill whatsoever. A man came up to me with a word that says, when I married Jennifer, she was working as a school psychologist. I wasn't working, it was the only year I was ever out of ministry in my whole life. And I worked with Allison to kind of disciple her, uh, Jennifer's daughter. And in the process, God says, I want you to prepare and minister to that girl for the next six months intensively. So I ministered to her intensively, went to school with her, sat at lunch. A man walked up from Morningstar, walked up to me one time. He was one of the instructors in the school, and I don't remember his name. He's not there now. But anyway, he said, uh, I don't know who you are or if you're even interested, but I've been sitting on this word for a long time. God told me to say, start preparing materials for the next six months. The six-month part caught my attention. For the next six months, prepare materials for teaching and training. And he said, I don't even know if you're interested, but I just had to give that word, and I feel so much relieved now that I gave it. <laughs> and the six-month thing took me, it was at the six-month mark with Allison, and the next six months, we prepared materials. We had no speaking engagements, no plan, no marketing, and I will not promote myself. That's just in my DNA from the time that I was a young Christian. And it was like, all dressed up and nowhere to go. But uh, we poured day in and day night. We've, we got materials together. All dressed up and nowhere to go. On one to the anniversary date, one year to the anniversary date, the last time I stood in the pulpit, they called me at a little church to do a seminar. And all of a sudden, for $25, we went up to New England to do a class. You know how much it costs to get to New England? <laughs> we were guaranteed $25 a week because that's what they were paying the local pastors just to show up and teach a class. And I said, it got me up there. It got me up there. Then all of a sudden, uh, Brian got somebody to uh, give us a place to stay. He gave them free tuition to the school if they gave us an apartment. We were in there for 25. We had some brochures made up during that preparation time, handed it to a pastor, he handed it to seven pastors. All seven pastors had us come and speak at their church. And we started working seven days a week from that time on and building materials. Then, you can see the materials we have. We have all these materials and no marketing at all. Zero marketing, zero. And all of a sudden, Sid Roth puts us on and this stuff's around the world. God didn't tell me a long time ago, here's what you do, Dennis. First you do this church, and then you do it, and then take a year off, and then, you know, and then, and then start from scratch, do nothing, and all of a sudden then make a lot of product, and then I'll put you on Sid Roth, and then Sid Roth will get the product out, and then they'll do it, and then Destiny Image will call you, and they'll say, we want to buy all your books. I had people that got their manuscripts turned down from Destiny Image, good friends of mine that love to write, and, they, and all of a sudden they're saying, we'll write the book for you, even out of your piece series, we'll do. And, and now it's like, all he told me to do was, you see this little funny little building over here? There's your relocation. I was going to go to Nashville and, uh, down with Jim Gall and Mickey and all them. And then I was going to go to Florida. And I was going to go to Connecticut. Now, that's the stuff you don't want to do. It's okay to think it. But if you start being driven by that, if you think you've got a better plan than God, you're going to be in serious trouble. He says, there's your relocation. Like, oh, great. Next door. I could walk here. That's my relocation. I've been waiting to go somewhere <laughs> significant. <laughs> so I still live in the same house. I just go next door and start this church. That's right. And, and God, see that bud unfolds. Real vision is obedience to Christ likeness and what God wants you to do. And it folds, unfolds gradually. You do not have the picture. You've got wishings. And those things will get you in trouble. Die to it. Let God resurrect in purity because many of the things he's spoken to you are accurate revelations. It's just that you just get so dangerous thinking you've got it all figured out. And you trip it up. So... God's timing and methods are necessary means to do it God's way. So, first of all, when it comes to a vision, God's not going to go in direct violation of Scripture. I've even had people go in violation of Scripture. So, you know, God's will is bigger purpose than you. 
and it's like a jet stream. The term we use in this church was the Abraham story. Abraham was successful when he entered into the God story and it was no longer the Abraham story. Most of the people I talk to that got a vision for their ministry and their life, most of it is a them story. It is not a God story. Until you make that adjustment, that faith adjustment in your vision and get back to redemptive purposes, you're going to shipwreck. So you need to get back to discovering God's will, no idols. We're going to do that today. We're going to die to that. Get the rhema and the scripture illumination that's necessary. Personal prophecy is all conditional based on your obedience too. Gifts of the Spirit, valid. The fruit of the Spirit, valid. There's a false peace. You know what a false peace shows up? When your flesh wants to do what you want to do, you'll say, I have a peace about it. But you're really only arguing and lying to yourself. I, I know God wants me to go buy a dozen donuts right now because I really have an attraction to donuts. I got a piece about it. That's the way, that's the way Christians are. I got a piece about it. No, you want what you want. You want it now. That's flesh. That's lust. That's dopamine rush. That is, <laughs> that is not bonding to the donuts. All right. When you're really bonded to God, you have kratos. You have dominion authority. You can say, maybe I will, maybe I won't. I'm the one that's under the power of the Spirit of God, and he's ruling. Maybe yes, maybe no, but I could go either way. I am not being controlled by one of them, all right? So here's God's way, and this is, this is what I really want you to see. I want to get to the answer real quick here, all right? There's, there's more we could say on vision and getting it proper properly said. Let's see if I'm leaving anything that's really important. Nah, here's the important thing. God's telling me that some of you need to first die to your vision. If you're a note taker, write this down because this is going to be so simple. You're going to be able to leave here new and improved. <laughs> All right. Die to your vision. If you won't die to your vision, you're telling me you're already in the lust. Because you're saying it came from God, but you can't give it to God. There's something wrong with that thinking, isn't there? What's, why can't you release it to God? Why can't you get a second opinion? If that robs your faith, you didn't have much faith anyway. You need to be more like Abraham. If I'm going to sacrifice my Isaac, by golly, God will raise him from the ashes because this is a promised seed. All right? But here's the three, here's the four levels. And I'm hoping that some of you make an adjustment to move to a higher level. All right? All of these are satisfactory, redemptive levels. Now, this is for kingdom life full stature, but I think it's generic enough for others. But if a person is a part of what we're doing, which, by the way, if you don't really have a real specific vision, when you become a part of somebody else's vision and you give it your whole heart, you basically, if, if God's leading you that way, then you basically are not going to die prematurely. You find out what God's doing, become part of it, and you're going to live a right old age. You're not going to go prematurely. But what some of your wishes and visions, what, what use are you? You're the center of your vision. Everything revolves around you. It's not going to make a kingdom difference whether you stay or go. <laughs> Potential. Here's the four levels. Level number one. And some people get stopped at a level. Let's say before I even give you these levels. How many are open to moving to another level in God? That terminology used to drive me crazy in church. Prophets always talk that. Uh, we're going to move to another level. I didn't see any change. I want, when I move to another level, I can see the change and I can verify the fruit and the, and the internal motivation that's showing me that that fruit is legitimate in me. So when I talk four levels, I can prove it. And you can too. I'm going to give it to you to where it's no-so. Number one, the first one is the revelation that God's given us is that we have tools, spiritual tools, to bring healing to the wounded body of Christ. Now, if you're too busy for that, you might be too busy. 
If you don't care that there's wounded people out there in the church, if you don't care there's people in your family that have great potential but they're emotionally sidelined, if you don't care then you, that, that other stuff is just too strong in your life, really. We have the tools here. So vision number one is, and we've had people supernaturally show up here that basically wanted to forgive somebody and really didn't know how to do it. And they showed up from other states and just popped in supernaturally. They didn't even know where we were at or why, and then all of a sudden they go, this is why I came here. And they learned to forgive and get freed up. That's element number one. And that will require an adjustment. But I'm concerned to bring healing to the wounded body. Let me give it to you in a, in a biblical format first. I'm gonna give you the biblical four and then I'm gonna give you our four. I already gave you one, so erase that one. Uh, here's the biblical four. When I'm talking about vision adjustment, the children of Israel are the best example. God had a plan before the foundation of the earth for them to be a blessing. Do you believe that? They were to be blessed to be a blessing. You bless Israel, you receive a blessing. That, is, that was the plan before there was a Garden of Eden. I'm so afraid that people with their vision don't take it far enough back to eternity past to see where God is going. Because you've got to stay focused on what is the ultimate. You, you need total concept before you look at your little vision. All right? The total concept is that I am going to bless. I, God the Father, am going to bless the pattern is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the pattern that is going to produce many sons unto glory. That's the eternal plan before there was a garden, before there was a fall, before Adam sinned. That was the plan. The Father was going to depict through Jesus Christ and draw all things together in him, and that Jesus Christ as the pattern would draw many sons and daughters unto himself and culminate in him. That's the pattern. Many sons is the goal. And that God himself would be your exceedingly great reward. That's healthy vision. But here's, here's the children of Israel. Their primary vision in Egypt was to get out of Egypt. Write that down. Primary vision, get out of Egypt. The second primary vision was get into the promised land. And we know how well they did that. Get out of Egypt. Get into the... But do you realize there is a faith adjustment? This is the part that I'm concerned with. This is the title of the message. It requires an adjustment to your vision or you will stay in Egypt. Or you get out of Egypt and say, I'm free and sit on your laurels the rest of your Christian life. No, it's about getting into the promises. It's getting into the promised land. Then you get into the promised land. Vision number two. Getting into the land. Step by step. Around and around. Until we get in. Vision number three. Joshua had to have an adjustment. Because now they found out, oh, here's the promised land. Oh, there's giants in this land. Oh, now we have to war. Now we have to basically occupy, possess the land. And possessing the land is really where I believe we're at for some of our leadership. And that is basically, this is time to war and resist and Christ the warrior rising up like in Isaiah 43, 42, 13. Um, to walk in kratos, that's dominion authority. In other words, it's one thing to get in the land, it's another thing to occupy and rule the territory. God wants jurisdiction. When we traveled, jurisdiction was my, one of my favorite teachings there because every place I went, I saw abdication. Uh, God gave me a job, but I don't like my boss. I quit. If God gave you the job, he gave you the grace to put up with it. Grow up. Quit abdicating your jurisdiction. We got to grow these people up there because they're like babies. 
And, but it's going to require an adjustment. In other words, okay, this rotten job, this, this job that God gave me, it isn't about me. The vision goes back to poor me. These people are picking on me. Circumstances are picking on me. I hate these circumstances. I hate these people. God deliver me. They're back in Egypt. God deliver me. I took you out of Egypt, but now you went back. And now you're asking me to take you back out. No. You stay there until you get an adjustment. <laughs> you need a chiropractic supernatural adjustment. You need to get into alignment that I sent you there with a purpose and it isn't about you. I am weary of people's visions that are centered in them. That's where they're in fantasy. It's spiritual pornography. And you're no longer attracted to the things that are right in front of you. And Jesus is right in front of you. His body is right in front of you. But you're attracted to this make-believe thing all about you. And God's saying, that third vision is to possess the land. And I'm saying, you know what? They're most of them are disoriented. In other words, who am I, where do I live, and what do I do for a living? If you can't answer that question, you are disoriented. If you were in a hospital emergency room, they would keep you. They think you hit your head. <laughs> who am I in Christ? Where do I live? Where's home base? Where has he placed a solitary in a family? Where do I really have? Because basically there's a, there's a tumbleweed in, in Jeremiah 17 that at this stage they can't progress to the fourth level of vision because quite frankly they're so afraid they're going to miss something they have to be everywhere and they can't get planted. They're afraid of planted. Planting is, is, brings the, the fear of control. I don't know, I've got a two-story deck and I like the railing I have. It doesn't intimidate me at all. It doesn't control me. It makes me feel safe that I've got some guidelines so I don't fall off my silly deck. The fourth level of the vision was for Israel to be a blessing. Not just possess the land, but after you possess the land, after you've occupied, and they stopped. We, we can stop at any level. Do you realize that? You can stop just getting out of Egypt. You can stop getting into the land, possessing the land, and of being a blessing. All right, here's kingdom life full stature. This is what God gave me from the time I was a baby Christian. This is the same principle, but I wanted you to see a biblical principle of how you have to adjust your approach. Joshua was not Moses. I like it. Joshua was a detemperament, and he was 40 years under someone else. <laughs> I find that exciting. What a detemperament, a natural born leader is put under someone else, it gets the best juice out of them. I'll tell you what, they just grow supernaturally, and then they become a good leader. So anyway, so Joshua, that's your free part. Uh, and here's the four elements for Kingdom Light Church full stature. One is that in our DNA, I know that I know that we have tools to help people and bring them emotional healing. And that it's a movement more than a ministry. It really is a movement because it will change how church is being done. But when you sit in a little church with, with uh, 50 people and, and you talk about being a movement, then you, but you know what? I know what I know. I've been around and I've seen the lives that have changed and I know it works. And it, it doesn't bother me. It's not being arrogant as much as it's being proactive. And I believe that we have the tools to bring healing to the wounded body of Christ. But the second part, if a person is really gonna adjust their vision and say, okay, this has worked, I feel better, I've been delivered, I've been healed, they've gotta say, the second part is, you gotta walk it. It's not enough to get your owies bandaged up. It's like, are you gonna make this a lifestyle? Because I've had people that say, oh, that's just that forgiveness stuff. I've got to have more stuff than that. That's because they only saw the healing through forgiveness and repentance. What they fail to see is the big picture. They, f they only see, and they probably stopped right there too. Because I'm afraid I'm going to miss something. So I can add or detract as I see fit. But in reality, what God is saying is the people that have really discovered the, how all-encompassing this is to maturity and a total Christian life, regardless of your gifting and regardless of your vision, that you would see that this was meant to be a lifestyle, not a band-aid. And there are people that need to adjust their vision to get to the place where, you know what? I can do this anywhere, anywhere, anytime, at work, at home, 
with any group of people from children on to adults. Then they've had a vision adjustment and that only comes by revelation and redemption because I know plenty of people that never made it to that part. They got a couple of healings, felt better, and that was the end of it. Never saw them again because they felt better because their vision was all about me. The third element is what I believe God is doing. Our strength is in sanctification and learning how to get issues dealt with. But the vision adjustment for me is I want to teach them how to warfare, to basically win the battles by displacement. In other words, walk in the reality of the supernatural peace of God that is militant, that the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet, to be so thoroughly made a lifestyle that you go in and you adjudicate instead of abdicate. Everywhere I went, I saw quality Christians, highly gifted, abdicating. Adjudicate instead of abdicate means that I must have a vision enlargement from I'm a nice person now. I've gotten rid of most of my issues. <laughs> People are actually talking to me now. You've got to move from there to where You've been given a jurisdiction. Enter into that marketplace and rule and reign with Kratos authority. Occupy. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials at the testing of your faith. It's producing something. By God, go there and get muscle. The more resistance you got, and if you're the only Christian in it, and God found you faithful to be the only Christian in the place, all the more power to you. That should be a badge uh, of honor to you to recognize that. But displacement means no more abdicating. I'm going to triumph in the midst of these circumstances for kingdom purposes. That's the third element. And until that can be learned, I have to teach people how to properly resist. It's like the, the rejection. I can teach a person quickly how to get free from the hurt and the pain of rejection. And rejection hurts more than most emotions. It even registers in the brain at, at the physical pain center. That's why it hurts more. But I can teach you how to release, but I want to take this third vision. I want vision adjustment to where you have a revelation that I am no longer going to be a victim. Sure, I know how to receive forgiveness for rejection, but now I don't want to take it in in the first place. Greater is he that's in me. I'm going to basically say, hey, I've got peace. That person's rejecting me. Displacement is going to take place because I'm occupying here and greater is he that's in me. I'm not taking that. Oh, I see that. It's like what they do with OCD people. They, they see progress when they get them to back up and say, if you're washing your hands forever and you're not stopping, if they would just take a step back, and this works secularly, and say, oh, that's my OCD they stand a chance of getting it fixed. Just think, if you would stand back and go, oh, there's that rejection thing again, instead of sucking it in and crying and going to have a pity party and poor me, how about saying, oh, there's that rejection thing again. Ooh, ooh, that hurt. Ooh, that hurt, but I ain't taking that in. I feel it. I hear it knocking, but I ain't taking it in. God's going to raise up a mighty men and women of valor who can go into a, a hostile arena and not suck it in and have to repent and forgive for, for taking it in, but rather resist. Testing, all of life is testing, and it's designed perfectly for you. Resisting to the degree you resist with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, to the degree you resist and maintain your peace or the rule of God, as God rules, you, to the degree you resist, you mature. Emotional maturity and spiritual maturity are synonymous, and people don't want to hear that. They want to think maturity is how much Bible they know. No, remember, level number two, you have to, you have to live that Bible. <laughs> and you're responsible to live it out. So that third element, and that's really where I believe much of us is. Here's what the Lord showed me. Our strongest anointing is for healing the emotionally wounded, and getting them spiritually to grow quickly. However, if that is our strongest anointing, therein lies our weakness. And the weakness will be, people will keep getting healing for, I was rejected, I forgive them. I got rejected, I forgive them. You could live the rest of your life as a victim, forgiving people who rejected you. You need vision adjustment 
and, and a faith adjustment to redemptively see something a little bit bigger as that flower unfolds in your life. But there was internal change that was required before you can get to the next level of vision. In other words, you got to live it first. Then after you live it and you found that it works victoriously for you in a non-hostile environment, now you have to go to like an army and face a hostile environment and displace the powers that be, which is real spiritual warfare. I see people shouting at the dark all the time and buying this, loose that, and everything. But quite frankly, real spiritual warfare is when you come in and they get out. Displacement. The last one. And for Jennifer and I, this has only started now. And I'm 66 years old, and it only started now. So some of you got your vision all planned out. Good for you, because I still haven't figured it all out. I just have to be obedient to what he's shown me. But this last stage is God says to be a blessing. All we ask God of do is that we will in... And by the way, you know when God does a movement, he always does it, and it's always... I think I can say always. I can't find. Whenever he, whenever he, well, yeah, but I'm saying uh, he always does it in obscurity. Always. He starts a movement in obscurity and then it builds momentum and it becomes a motivation. It's like a snowball going downhill. And I believe we're entering into that and I have attempted no marketing whatsoever. None. But God is opening the door, and he told us a year ago, I'm opening a door that no man can shut for a year and a half. Isaiah 22, 22. And I still see 11, 11, 22, 22, 44, 44. Every time I turn around, God says, I have not changed. That door is flung wide open. And basically, the blessing to be a blessing. There are people getting healed all over the world from what we did by not giving up and just doing what we were to do in obscurity all of our lives without a lot of detail. But step by step of obedience. I really believe now that we are in the season where we're being a blessing to other people that don't know us and it's going around the world. And now after Sid Roth, which we still have tremendous feedback from that, and that's been what, how long has that been? A year? A year and a half, and it still, still has momentum. Now Destiny Image has a totally different audience, and it's going to be blessing people. So that fourth level is to be a blessing, be a blessing. But I'll tell you what, you know, before God takes you from the pit to the prison to the palace, there is works of obedience on the inside where you don't know all the answers. So let's do that first. Let's die to your interpretations. What have you got to lose? If you really want God, you've got some visions and dreams that you've had for a long time. Some of them even shipwrecked. Some of them need to be resurrected because you quit and gave up. But it was your scenario, your timing, and your interpretation that destroyed it. What you needed to do was simply say, what God promised that he will bring the past, but it's like, it's like Abraham, when God? When? I've, you know how long I've waited? You can, you can go that routine, but it won't get you anywhere because <laughs> it's still going to be his timing. So Father, we just pray right now, and if you're watching by Ustream, that God's placed many things in my heart, and a lot of things have not come to pass. A lot of things have shipwrecked. But God's saying this is the time for resurrection. This is the time for dormant giftings to emerge. This is the time when the hard shell over that seed that's been planted in your heart is going to be removed. This is the time to cease and desist fantasizing. This is a time to cease and desist making make-believe uh, romances and make-believe uh, uh, lovers that God says you've scattered your charm under every, every hill. God's saying this is a time to return to me your first love and say that Christ would be formed in me. For this reason was I taken from my mother's womb, that Christ might be formed in me, that Christ might be revealed in me, an internal revelation of Jesus Christ. And externally, we're going to be obedient to the heavenly vision and we're going to go step by step in serving and loving God and being part of what God has called us to do. At level one, in order for this to take place, we can't put armor on wounded people. So level number one of the revelation is God. I welcome that healing balm of Gilead that comes even through this ministry that's going to bring healing to my broken heart and to those broken in my family and those broken in my relationships. And I'm going to say, wash away the fantasies and all of the plan B's that I made because things weren't 
weren't working out. I ask you right now to just, I'm putting that on the altar once and for all, and I receive forgiveness for any, any vision making of my own kind, any wishes and <laughs> that, that I've destroyed. And I ask you to receive forgiveness for that right now. And God, deliver me out of, from myself. Cause me to lift my vision higher, lift it higher than I've ever lifted it before and, and look unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of my faith and to look unto him to, to form in me that after you heal me, I'm gonna make this a lifestyle and making this a lifestyle, I'm gonna live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Then I'm gonna graduate to the third level and that third level is gonna say, God, I'm going to basically learn to know who I am, where I live, what I do for a living. I'm going to get rooted and grounded. I'm not going to be a tumbleweed, afraid that I'm going to miss something. And I'm going to get rooted and grounded and stabilized to the that I will grow up and I will be planted and flourish in the courts of the Lord. And that I am going to possess the land and I'm going to walk with Kratos authority. No matter where you place me, God, no matter how mundane the project is, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And I am not quitting. My battle cry is my victory banner, Jehovah Nisi, my victory banner, is that in this place, God, that I will occupy and rule and reign. And the banner over me is the love of God. And so I'm gonna possess that land. And, and I'm going to learn to resist the enemy of my soul. I'm going to learn to stand strong, and I'm going to begin to move as David's mighty men. And in that place, after I've possessed the land and I've, and I've got a track record of victory, once I've got a track record of victory, and I can see that this is really working, that I've learned to move in hostile territory and actually live in victory, then all of a sudden, then I'm going to say, I'm going to move to the fourth level. And that is, I'm going to be one that is going to uh, be a blessing and reproduce these things, these tools, because they are in me. And the, because they are working in me, I'm going to be an instructor and teach other people to do these things. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Those are cyclical. And even though it's a one, two, three, four, you could actually taste a little bit in all four. I've seen newbies get out there and start helping people instead of it being all about their healing. And basically they learn and grow faster than others who go, well, you know, I don't want to embarrass anybody. And that's her thing. So, so thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.